Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Infertility Channel. You found us once again. We're so appreciative that you're here. And today is Viewer Mail Thursday, and literally I've not seen these questions. My producer and director and dear friend loves to hit me with these, throw me a little curveball. So here come the questions. Okay, questions. Nikki from Amarillo, Texas. You know, there's a great restaurant I used to hit when I used to go back and forth across the country from, from UCLA to Florida where my parents lived. I, I was an undergrad out there. It was called Amarillo Slims. And I don't know if it's still there, but Amarillo Slims used to give you this huge dinner, 72 ounce steak, plus baked potato, vegetables, bread, salad, and you had to eat it in a certain amount of time. I think it was an hour. And um, if you kept it down, you get, get to have it for free, but not many people were able to do that. So they ended up paying an arm and a leg for Amarillo Slims. Anyway, what does Nikki say? Can being infertile be caused by something I did, maybe even while I was a child? Well, that's a great question, Nikki. Um, I guess it's possible, uh, you know, that if uh, there were a childhood infection and it's not uncommon for little girls to have uh, urinary tract infections and it's not talked about much, but not uncommonly, uh, little girls will place things up into the vagina and, and uncommonly even into the urethra and those can cause pelvic infections. Um, certainly appendicitis and a ruptured appendix can cause scar tissue. We've talked about that in a previous episode. Um, high fevers could, I, I guess, cause problems uh, for the ovaries, especially if those were sustained. Childhood cancers and chemotherapy can certainly cause problems on into the adulthood years that can cause problems for fertility. So there are a number of childhood conditions that could conceivably lead to problems having a baby down the road. Okay, next question comes from Sabina in Lelystad, Netherlands. Does it hurt when eggs are harvested or when fertilized eggs are put back in? Well, I had uh, a patient a few years ago who had gone through IVF with us and we had frozen her embryos. And we called her back because three years almost were up and we said, do you intend to use your embryos? And she says, yes, but the reason I've not come back is because I've been afraid. Do you use general anesthesia to put my embryos back into me? We're a little bit puzzled. We said, well, why general anesthesia? No anesthesia at all is necessary. She goes, well, then forget it. I'm not coming back. I'm not going to have those embryos put back. We said, well, why not? She goes, look, they've been growing in your freezer for two and a half years. I have no clue how big they are, and there's no way you're putting those things back up inside of me. So we told her that you know, once we freeze the embryos, they stay where they are. If they're eight cells, they're eight cells in three years. If they're 100 cells, they're 100 cells in three years. So that's, uh, Sabina, not the answer to your question. Let me get to your question. Does it hurt when eggs are harvested or fertilized eggs, embryos are put back? Well, egg retrieval, egg harvesting is done under sedation and it's through the vein. It's called monitored anesthesia care. Plus sometimes it's a local anesthetic your doctor might inject behind the cervix to decrease pain. The embryo transfer is a painless procedure, very analogous, very much like an intrauterine insemination. So no anesthesia is necessary for that. So it does not hurt. All right, Renee from Los Angeles. Does the viability of frozen eggs degrade over time? That's a wonderful question, Renee. And um, I think the short answer is, if so, imperceptibly, minimally. We believe that there are probably some ultra-structural changes in eggs, but over the last several years in our clinic, we have not lost a single egg cell or a single embryo. Now, officially, we can only say 90 plus percent freeze-thaw viability rate, but in actual fact, the freeze-thaw rate is very high. The embryo development rate from frozen eggs is very high. So we see this as a wave of the future. We see fertility preservation as being something that many, many women will be doing in their 20s, such that they can delay childbearing into their 30s or 40s. So we do believe that once your eggs are frozen, they tend not to degrade over time. Okay, many, many questions, too many people to count, have asked this, how many embryos should I implant? That's a great question. And there are some guidelines by our parent society, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, or ASRM. If you want to go into the asrm.org website, you can see the number of embryos that are recommended according to your age. Now, typically these days, if a patient is 36 years of age and younger, most of the best clinics will recommend a single embryo transfer 
older than that, maybe two or three embryos, depending upon underlying conditions, the number of previous IVF cycles you've gone through, and of course, the quality of your embryos. So if embryo quality is suboptimal, maybe another embryo should be put back. Great question from all of those listeners and viewers. Uh, Shana from Germantown, Tennessee. I know Germantown. I lived in Memphis for many years. Germantown's actually a, uh, I guess, a bedroom community uh, these days of Memphis. What are the ethical boundaries, if any, for Christians seeking the aid of science in conceiving? Wow. Um, that probably deserves about 10 shows in and of itself, the ethics of assisted reproductive technology. Um, you know, it turns out that uh, Christians, Catholic Christians, tend not to proceed with IVF. Uh, Vatican II, the uh, Vatican II Council recommended against in vitro fertilization. The old procedure called gamete interfallopian transfer or GIFT is where we used to put eggs and sperm side by side in the fallopian tube. That's a laparoscopic procedure. And that is okay with Vatican II. So Catholic Christians uh, tend not to do IVF unless they have a special dispensation by their priest or bishop. Uh, whereas Protestants uh, tend not to have so many problems with the idea of sperm and eggs meeting in the petri dish. Oftentimes that's the only way that they can conceive. So I would recommend that you talk to your pastor uh, or your priest if you're contemplating these things. Um, Judaism does not have these problems or prescriptions against the assisted reproductive technologies. And we know that um, many of the Jewish people in Israel have unlimited access to IVF. So uh, please do talk to your parish priest or, or pastor about uh, the ethical boundaries of that. I think this is a highly personalized decision and only ultimately you and uh, God through prayer and meditation can, can come up with the best answer there. So those are the, uh, are the questions and I, I could, these really were spontaneous, but I could hardly imagine a better segue uh, than this last question from Shana. So thank you for that. So I'd like to show you a picture. So this is me as a little guy. I don't know how old I was there, maybe two or three, but I almost didn't make it. My mother was in labor for many, many hours, I think 40 plus hours. My head delivered, I was 10 pounds and she was about five feet tall. So the head delivered and immediately kind of went back inside and they ended up having to do an emergency cesarean section. And the doctor came out even mid-surgery. I don't know if he was the primary surgeon or the first assistant and told, my dad and my grandparents, he said, you know, if you're believers, you better start praying because it, we're going to be lucky if either survives. So that was my initial brush with death. There have been a couple of others, and I was relating that on a mission trip to Ethiopia some years ago. Here's where it gets interesting. So minutes before I was to speak, completely unbeknownst to me, I was told, you're going to go and speak to that congregation of around 1,800 people. And kind of deer before the headlights, I said, what? And they said, you didn't get the email? You're supposed to speak. I thought you'd prepared. I said, I, I, first I'm hearing about it. I said, I'll be happy to try. So I got up and I told these people, lovely people, how much I loved Ethiopia, how beautiful the people were, how lovely the coffee was, all the diplomatic things to say. And I told them that I was an MD. They had no clue what that meant. And the translator had a bit of difficulty. And I said, but if I were smarter, I would have been a PhD, but I was only born with half a brain. So he translated that and all of the people got big eyed and were agape. And he said, is this true that you were born with half a brain? I said, well, almost. And uh, he said, well, can you tell us about that? I said, yeah, I was actually born dead, but they, they revived me. So he translated that. And once again, the audience went like that. And so with the microphone up, he shielded the mic. He goes, let me ask you a question. Do people find you funny in the United States? I said, well, some people think I'm hilarious. He said, well, you're not funny here. He goes, no more jokes. So I've decided not to tell any more jokes, but true stories. And that really was a true story. I look forward to seeing you here next week and telling you more stories out of my practice. Thanks for watching us on the Infertility Channel. Be sure to share this video with your friends and subscribe to catch all new episodes each week here on the Infertility Channel. Plus, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. 
I love hearing from you. Comment below or tell me what you want to see on future episodes by sending me an email to comments at infertilitychannel.org. Until next week.